And in theory, I'm live. Let's see how that works. Hello, everybody. Just waiting for people to appear, verifying and putting things on the Twitters and the LinkedIn's and all the other places. So welcome, welcome. Be comfortable. Make yourselves at home. Talk to each other. And I'll be with you on Decoding Tech Talk in just a moment. Welcome, people are arriving, I can see. Thank you. Oops. There we go, yep. Appreciate that you're arriving. I'll be getting started in just a moment. I just have to figure out how to navigate all the different social medias. There's too many social medias. I think we should have just one. I have to tell everybody where we are. And then they know how to find us. Getting it all set up. Oh. Having trouble getting set up. Apologies for setup challenges. I'm supposed to be technical. That doesn't necessarily mean that I know exactly how it all works. Hang on for a second. We'll be getting started on Decoding Tech Talk in just a moment. Here we go. Okay. Finally actually got the LinkedIn's and the Twitter's to work. Okay, so one thing I used to threaten was that uh, I was going to start a startup whose whole mission in life was, uh, yes, that is an old timey 1940s microphone. That's exactly right, George. Um, one thing I used to threaten was that I would start a startup whose mission in life was to make sure that um, uh, the five minutes that you spend before starting any um, discussion in the online meeting. Remember those days when we used to have people at home and in the office? And uh, there was always that five minutes of uh, messing about. And our, our word in England for that is FAF, F-A-F-F. -F. So maybe somebody has taken FAF.com now, but I used to threaten that every time we were waiting in that period to uh, start FAF, to buy FAF.com and get it started. Okay, so uh, people may join us as we go, but uh, I'm going to get started anyway. Welcome to Decoding Tech Talk. I appreciate that uh, lots of folks uh, showed interest and have shown up. I think people will show up uh, as we go, so I'll try to fill people in. Um, I have super high-tech uh, tools here uh, for Decoding Tech Talk. So uh, if I hold that up appropriately, then maybe you can see everything it's got to say. There you go. Perfect. Microphone gets in the way, but it's not perfect. But actually, this is a perfect example of um, avoiding the kinds of things that tend to intimidate people. 
So uh, if I show up with this, you're not intimidated by my sound and lights. You know, I, I don't look like I'm uh, showing up with something that's automatically correct. You're going to have to listen to what I have to say. And this is the sort of thing that you can encourage your tech people to use is what could you do that's low tech? Actually, my favorite way, for example, of tracking bugs and tasks is with a board just like this one. Because guess what? What you never have to do is change uh, some code in order to make the board do something different. You use a rubber. In, in America, we call it an eraser. Uh, you rub something out, and you put something else on. So that's my favorite way. I don't need Jira. I don't need uh, target process. I forget what all the other ones are called. Um, I don't need those. Uh, I can just get started. Now, the one thing I don't have is very good lighting. So let me make sure I hold this correctly. Excellent. So uh, if I lean over it, I'll figure out all the how all this works. Uh, we're, we're making it. And some more people are showing up. Good. So uh, what we're going to talk about is three topics related to decoding tech talk. The first is that refactoring is baloney. And I'll explain why you shouldn't believe somebody who tells you they're refactoring, and that's why it's taking them a ridiculous time to finish. Um, second is set the tilted slider appropriately. I'll explain what the tilted slider is and uh, how you use it and why it would be helpful to you. And building trust with IT. And that one I may try to make interactive. We'll see uh, how interactive we can get here. Uh, the, the technology may uh, escape me, so we'll, we'll see how I do. OK, so uh, that's the topics. And by the way, I should mention that uh, this is all coming from, I guess I should point at the correct side. Uh, this is all coming from uh, material that's in a workshop on decoding tech talk, much longer with more material, a half day. And that is uh, on douglassquirrel.com if you want to know more about that. So uh, let's talk about refactoring. So uh, stick in the chat. Um, uh, I think I can see everybody's chat comments. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but it has worked in previous live streams, but I'm, I'm always doubtful. So uh, there should be a chance to see comments. So please make a comment if you have ever heard an engineer say, oh, yes, uh, that's going to take us uh, an extra two weeks or an extra two months, or in one case, I remember an extra nine months because uh, we need to refactor. We need to change how this code works. Uh, this is old code. It's spaghetti. It's stuff we can't use anymore. We're frustrated with it. Uh, so if you've heard that, please uh, make a comment, because I'd like to incorporate your comments. By the way, I should say also, stop me with questions. I like questions. Do not feel constrained that somehow you'll be interrupting me. You have to wait for the questions at the end. This is an, an interactive session. I would, I would sure like to, to hear your comments and stop and, and comment and, and uh, have a dialogue with you. So please feel free to do that. Right. So uh, what's wrong with refactoring? Well, actually, nothing is wrong with refactoring. It's just that no one knows what it means, or, or everyone seems to have forgotten. So um, refactoring is from an old book. Uh, I don't have it here in the house, um, so I'd have to go out to the shed to get it, I think. Um, but it's a, a book by Martin Fowler. I think it's from the early 2000s. Um, and it's a book all about how to do refactoring, which I think is wonderful, as described in the book. Good. George says he's heard it before. Excellent. So I'm... I'm uh, I'm ticking my audience correctly. You've heard that we're going to be refactoring for a long time. Let me explain why that's balloon. Because the real refactoring takes about 60 seconds. And uh, Fowler goes into great detail. Fowler is one of the great uh, tech writers. He's very, very clear. Um, even if you're not a techie, you can read his material and it'll all make lots of sense. Um, and he goes through a whole bunch of different uh, code refactorings, things you can change to improve your code. And each of them takes 60 seconds to finish. And maybe if it's really tough or you don't know how to do it or you're not good at it or you mess it up, it might be five minutes, maybe 10. Anything that's longer than that isn't refactoring. It may still be a useful thing, but whoever is telling you it's refactoring is fooling themselves and you. So you can tell them officially from Squirrel. You have an official message from me that uh, uh, re refactoring is baloney when used in that way, when they come along to you and say, uh, uh, this, this is going to take months and months because, it's, uh, because of our refactoring. Now, let me tell you something about spaghetti code as well. So uh, I was CTO at a company called Secret Sales, and, and fallen on some hard times now. It's still running, but an e-commerce company selling all kinds of uh, wonderful products. And uh, I came in, and I said, so how's our code? And they all said, oh, it's spaghetti. Oh, man, Squirrel, you can't believe how bad this code is. Everybody hates our code. It's so difficult to work with. And I went to the guy who'd written a lot of the code, and he said, I can't do a Bulgarian accent, but I'll do the closest I can. He was sitting in his chair. He's very relaxed. He had his e-cigarette. These were all very new at the time. And so we went, yes, Squirrel. Yes, our code, it is spaghetti. I have written spaghetti. Yes, I agree. But it is nutritious spaghetti. Everyone here, they all have jobs. Thanks to my nutritious spaghetti. 
And I couldn't argue with him because we did all have jobs because of his code that actually worked. So we had to uh, and do something about that. So I went to the team and I went and I said, okay, guys, what are we doing about this? Because it's obviously very hard to work with. And they said, don't worry, Squirrel. We have a plan for dealing with it. I said, wonderful. Sounds like your plan is good. How long is your plan going to take? They said, one year. I said, excellent. How long have you been working on your plan? And they said, we have been executing our plan. We've been writing code. We've been making changes for one year. I said, hallelujah, the spaghetti's almost gone. They said, no, we have another year to go. So that's the problem that happens when you get into this um, pattern of refactoring where you just refactor all the time and you say, I'm doing this massive project. I'm going to rebuild everything. I'm going to make it better. Um, and uh, that usually does not work out. <laughs> that is not usually what happens. What usually happens is exactly what happened to me at Secret Sales, that it takes a year and then it takes another year and then you're never finished because you're always trying to catch up. What you should be doing instead is something called the strangler pattern. And you can go back to uh, our friend uh, Martin Fowler if you want to look up strangler pattern. It's actually the modern name apparently is strangler fig pattern. It comes from uh, this plant, and I don't understand this plant very well, uh, but this plant grows around a tree, I think around fig trees, I'm not sure. Uh, and it grows around the tree and then it gradually strangles the tree. And so when you find an older plant in the wild, the tree may be dead and gone. The tree is kind of, you know, it's disintegrated because the plant has eaten it, but it eats it from the outside and it gradually comes in from around the bark and it goes in and in and in and in and eventually there's no tree left. And that's the sort of thing you want to do. Uh, there was a client I worked with recently in the music industry who uh, applied this very successfully. And uh, they came to me saying, yeah, we've been doing this project as we're rebuilding everything, we're fixing it all up. They gave it a, a scary monster name, which was not helpful because they, they always talked about the scary monster, the Kraken who was going to come and eat them. This was not a great name for their project. And they, uh, uh, because it was eating them, <laughs> it was causing them not to release any software. And uh, I came along and said, couldn't we do something here that would be much more iterative? Couldn't we make progress? Couldn't we actually roll this out? It kind of looks almost finished. We could actually be using this in the real world. And uh, we, we could then gradually strangle the rest of the application. We'd replace a bit at a time, just like the, the, the fig plant, whatever it is, um, digests the bark and then the outer bark and then the inner bark and then so on and, and kind of gradually um, absorbs the tree. Couldn't we do the same thing? And they said, gosh, we never thought of that. And they went off and tried it. And lo and behold, we were live to uh, one of their locations, uh, one of their services um, within a few weeks. And then uh, they rolled it out within the next couple of months. Whereas previously they'd thought, gosh, this is gonna take years to finish. Um, you know, this is, this is really, really behind. We have to replace everything. So when it, that's the first uh, message for decoding tech talk. When uh, the tech folks tell you we're refactoring, ask them, how long did it take you? And look at your watch because you, you want to be able to say, all right, so you can start now. And then 60 seconds later, you say, all right, you're done. If that's not what they're doing, it's not refactoring and it is likely dangerous. So what you want to go for is the strangler fig or strangler pattern instead of that. Okay, so I hope that's something that will apply to at least some of you who are currently fighting with uh, uh, total rebuilds uh, that are masquerading as refactoring. And um, there's lots more. I have a whole baloney test of um, the kinds of uh, language that you would expect to see, uh, that you'd expect to hear in this kind of situation. And um, if you hear those kinds of words, then you know what uh, what to do about it. You, you know what actions to take. So I'm uh, going to be covering that in the, in the workshop um, that uh, will be happening later this month. So what are we talking about next? So next, we're going to talk about the tilted slider. Uh, so I'm going to draw the tilted slider. It's actually in my book. I'm not trying to sell the book. I, I don't really care about book sales. I'll send you a free copy if you uh, drop me an email. Um, Agile Conversations by me and my good friend, Jeffrey Frederick. Uh, so we have in there a nice picture of the tilted slider, but I'm intentionally not uh, using that picture, although it's much nicer. It's actually drawn by someone who's capable. And I'm doing that because I wanna emphasize again, how valuable it is to show that you're not using sound and lights, that you're not trying to overwhelm the other person. And um, if your uh, tech team shows up, you, you know, whenever I do due diligence, and I do this for lots of uh, venture capitalists, when I do the due diligence, I'll come along and say, okay, so uh, show me your documents, show me your materials, don't write anything for me. I know I'm in trouble when somebody goes and writes a hundred page uh, slide, a hundred slide deck uh, for me, because uh, that's when they're, they're uh, starting to give me the snow job. They, they have something to sell. They have something to 
probably something to hide um, behind the fancy material that they're putting together. I much prefer something somebody scribbles on a whiteboard, um, puts together on a cocktail napkin, they go into Miro or one of those tools and they, they show me something. So that's what I'm doing for you today. So I'm gonna show uh, the tilted slider. So um, some of you uh, may remember that uh, back in long, long ago, in the Stone Age, when we were allowed out of our houses, um, you could move a little slider on a physical device. And uh, it was often on a radio. That's how you tune your radio. And now we have those kinds of things. The fancy word is skeuomorphic, skeuomorphic things in our, uh, on our screens. And you don't move them with your finger. Well, not directly. Maybe you do on your iPad. But um, you, you move them with your mouse or something like that. And you move them up and down. That's what the slider is but it's tilted and that's what's strange about it. So uh, at the top end, uh, and I'm gonna show you this picture in a second, I can't draw, I haven't figured out how to draw and show it to you. I need an easel or something, maybe I'll get that. Uh, so at the top end is uh, productivity and at the bottom end is predictability. And then there's a force of gravity. And those are all the components. So now that I've been uh, describing this, I will now show you with no sound and lights what the tilted slider looks like. Let's see if I can get it to fit on the screen. There you go. So you got productivity at the high end, uh, predictability at the low end, and you can imagine some little marks along here. I'm not good enough to draw those. And here's your slider. You can move it up and move it uh, up and down. Hard to do this backwards. Okay, you know what I mean. I think you can see what I'm talking about. So stick in the chat for me if you don't mind. Where are you on that slider? Are you up there at uh, pr uh, productivity? Uh, where you're getting a lot done, but maybe not very predictable, or are you way down at the other end at predictability? Both are valuable. It's perfectly valid to be at any stage on there. So if you marked it one to 10 from uh, one being super predictable and 10 being super productive, but you have no idea when it's gonna get done, where, where do you sit? So stick that in the chat for me. That'll give me a sense where people are. Um, and while I'm doing that, I'll tell you uh, another story. I was just reading this this morning. Um, that uh, a lot of you will probably know or remember or maybe aren't old enough but have read about uh, something called the Challenger disaster, uh, where a spaceship, uh, was the space shuttle was about to launch. Uh, it was freezing on the, uh, on the decks. Uh, uh, it was freezing on the, the, the platform on which it was standing. I don't know all the fancy names for these things. Um, and there were icicles on the, on the, the gantry. And uh, a lot of engineers knew that the spaceship was not safe to fly in those conditions. There were rings that would expand and uh, cause problems. And uh, there was actually one guy, I didn't know this part of the story, but there was one guy who actually refused to sign the piece of paper that said, I agree this spaceship is safe to fly today. Go ahead and send these people up. In fact, they had a civilian on the, uh, on the ship. It wasn't even a... Um, uh, somebody who wasn't even an astronaut. Um, and of course it launched and exploded and um, uh, there was great uh, consternation afterwards. It's one of the great examples of normalization of deviance. Um, this guy apparently stood up later in a meeting and where everybody else was saying, yes, we, you know, we, uh, we approved it and you know, th this is why we approved it and so on. He said, you know what, actually I didn't approve it. <laughs> I didn't sign the paper. Uh, uh, stood up and, and talked to the commission about uh, how, how difficult it was. So um, the, thing, the point I'm making there is that um, uh, uh, th this, this um, uh, uh, predictability productivity axis is one that NASA, at least most of the time, lives way at the bottom of. So they are way down at um, uh, super predictable. Because if you don't launch the rocket at the right time, Mars isn't in the right place. And you got to kind of get Mars at the right place in, in order to get the rocket there. So predictability is super important to them. Productivity is something that you get in startups um, where uh, very small startups where there might be just uh, one engineer and they come in, they say, what do we want to do today? And they rip it out. E-commerce companies are often at that end of the tilted slider as well. So we're getting some answers, by the way, about where people are. So unpredictably productive. Um, so uh, that that's uh, way up at the at the productive end. So uh, not very predictable at all. That's uh, one person has there, uh, and then somebody else uh, has. Oh, I'm afraid it's first answers only. Oh, I see. So you guys are discussing it. Um, uh, closer to predictability is what somebody else says. Okay, fantastic. So uh, we've got one person who's uh, sort of more toward the predictability end, and one more toward the productivity end. But there's a point about it being tilted, right? Because when you look at it on a radio, the, the old style of radios or, or in your skeuomorphic thing on your screen, it's horizontal, right? Maybe it's vertical, but it's, it's not tilted. Why, why is this thing tilted? That's such a strange idea. Well, it's because of the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is the desire for control. 
So something that happens when you have unproductive conversations with your tech team, when you, you don't have trust, when you don't have a, a, a good mechanism for working with your tech team and you're kind of intimidated by them, uh, well, when, when that happens, you uh, often wind up saying, well, gee, it would be good if I could control this situation. I mean, I don't know what the heck's happening over there. And they always talk this techno babble and they talk about refactoring this and microservices that and something else and I'm confused. But as long as I know they're going to be done on Thursday, at least they'll be done on Thursday with something. And so you tend to push that slider down toward the um, uh, predictability end, which, if you're NASA, makes perfect sense. Sounds awesome. You know, it would be great to be NASA. It would be great to be predictable, and we can definitely get the rocket to Mars on time. And if you run a business that's like that, no arguments with you. I have one. Uh, that I did due diligence for recently that um, uh, uh, manages where drones are in the sky. You kind of don't want drones to run into each other. And even more, you don't want them to run into airplanes, right? Kind of important to get that right. And so they have a very careful, very slow process. And they're way down on the tilted slider, right? They're way down on the uh, uh, predictability end. And that's good for their business. The problem I often see is when somebody says, look, I don't actually need to be that predictable. I might not mind being at that other end. We've got somebody in the chat who says, look, I'm like, extremely unpredictable, but I'm awfully productive. And that works for me. I'd like to be there, but man, if I'm going to get any productivity, I need to you know, like make it as predictable as possible. The problem is there is a trade-off. So if engineers are doing a bunch of planning and estimating and figuring out exactly what they're going to do and doing all the detailed work that somebody like that engineer at NASA would do in order to know that we can't launch if the temperature is below 47 degrees, um, uh, if, if there's somebody like that uh, doing that kind of work, they're not writing code and they're not experimenting and they're not helping you to learn from your customers. So there's a trade-off there between those two things. And sometimes, and this requires some trust, which is what we're about to talk about. Um, but when you get to that level of trust, when you get to the point where you can say, all right, fine, I'm going to um, re release some of my desire for control and let the team be more productive, you can actually unlock a lot of productivity. And I, I see that often in uh, organizations that I come into uh, and I describe to them, uh, you know, it, there's this option. Would you like to take this option? And they, they kind of need some help from me to feel that level of trust. Uh, but there's things that you could do to improve that yourselves. Right. So that's topic number two. I hope that was helpful. So you can think about where you want to be on the tilted slider. I should say, by the way, for the person who's way up at the extremely unpredictable end, you can move it down, right? There's nothing wrong with following the, the, the laws of gravity and moving it down to have greater control. That's a choice you can make. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that as well. Right. And then the third topic is building trust with IT. So this is the fundamental thing that uh, really is probably going wrong that leads to these others. So why are you hearing baloney about refactoring? Why aren't you hearing about um, business results? Well, that's probably because um, uh, you, you don't have the level of trust you'd like to. And uh, why are you uh, uh, setting the tilted slider further down than you'd like to? You're, you're closer to... Um, uh, uh, pre predictability than productivity, where you'd like to, you might like to be. That's again because you're lacking trust. And what I hear all, over and over again, um, and we're going to deal with it a lot at this workshop that I'm that I'm mentioning. You can see that on DouglasSquirrel.com. Um, the 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 thing that I hear over and over again is, look, I just can't have confident conversations. I don't believe these guys. I don't believe that they're going to deliver because they don't deliver. I don't see it. And all I hear is this wall of noise. I can't figure out what all the techno babble means. There's lots of things that you can do to address that. But let me give you just one particular uh, tool to use. Um, and I'll invite you guys in the chat again to ask questions, to argue with me, to say, Squirrel, this doesn't make sense. I don't agree. Um, you know, this, this wouldn't work for me because I'd love to try it out with you. Um, but uh, let me describe to you how this might sound. I was just doing this um, literally an hour ago with a, a client, huge mistrust, both sides. So the technical person doesn't trust the salesperson. The salesperson who's been madly selling, just taking over his market, doing an amazing job selling, has written checks that the tech team can't cash. So they, they don't believe that he's uh, got their best interests at heart. And he doesn't believe the same of them because he keeps figuring out how to take over the market. He says, look what this is gonna do to our valuation and to our market dominance and everything else. And he, he brings them in to, to show them this and uh, it doesn't get the response that he expects. He just hears, uh, no, 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 we can't do it. But they did a wonderful thing. I'm so proud of them. Uh, they applied something without knowing that they were applying it uh, that I learned uh, some years ago from a, a, a product manager who is also studying Hebrew. And he taught me this Hebrew phrase, which I'm sure I'm murdering. So I, I would love it if somebody told me 
what the correct phrase was and how to how to spell it and so on because I didn't write it down at the time correctly with him. I wish I had. I wish I knew the Hebrew letters. But the phrase is liko likrat. Uh, and liko likrat literally means coming toward. So I'm coming toward you here on the screen, right? So I'm moving closer to you. Um, but it, what it means, um, it, it's, its connotation, its uh, idiomatic meaning is building a bridge to someone else, finding a way to, to work with them. Not quite making a compromise, because it may be that I build a bridge to you that I find a way to come toward you uh, in, a, in another way that doesn't compromise what I'm thinking about. Um, and uh, they did a, an incredible job of Lee Cody Krat. I was really, really impressed because what they started with was they said, uh, this is the CTO uh, at this company. He said, look, before we get into this discussion of uh, yet again, how are we going to deliver to customer X that sales has sold to that we can't actually figure out how to deliver to? What I want to do is make sure I absolutely understand what uh, everybody's thinking. And he drew a, a two by two matrix. I thought he was going to become a consultant. You know, he's going to do the Boston thing with the, the quadrants. No, that's not what he did. He said, well, look, this is how sales looks at it. And this is how uh, sales see it if we sell and how sales see it if we don't sell, uh, and if we don't deliver to this company. And here's how tech sees it if we do deliver to this company and if we don't. And of course, tech, tech's view was if we do deliver, we're going to throw everything else off. And if we don't, then we can keep on track. And sales was we won't take over the market if we don't sell. And uh, we we will if we if we do. So it was a very helpful matrix for giving the detail of of their their respective views. And what was amazing was that somebody in the meeting then noticed that when you looked at the matrix, you actually saw that delivery meant something different to to each side. For sales, delivery was um, having something that made the customer happy. The customer was phoning them up saying, "Where are you? We aren't doing anything. You stink." They just wanted the phone calls to stop. Didn't matter how. The tech side thought delivery meant get everything finished, perfectly polished, totally production ready, all set to go. It turned out there was a wonderful thing that they could do in the middle. There isn't always, but in this case, building the trust first and understanding the other person's story meant that they detected a hole. They said, wait a minute, there's something here that could work for both. And what they turned out they were able to do was to build something that met a lot of the customer's needs, but they could outsource. So in fact, the tech team who was overloaded and had too much to do wouldn't have to touch it at all. They could give it to somebody else, pay them a bunch of money. Money wasn't the issue. The customer had plenty of that. Um, they could get the customer. They could get the the customer's features built using something that was completely not related to their code at all. And the s developers could keep working in the code, servicing the other customers, and the um, uh, de uh, uh, outsourced developers would get the other piece done. And they're busy executing that now. And uh, they were they were very happy about it. And we just went through another iteration of that, and we started with the same Likoli Krat X exercise of understanding what's the other person's point of view, what's my point of view, and just doing that to start with and making sure it was in language that everybody could understand. The tech people didn't have Kubernetes and refactoring and microservices and all that stuff on their side, and the salespeople didn't have you know uh, weird sales speak about commissions or um, uh, uh, statements of work or anything. It was, it was very clear, plain English, and each side was able to understand the other. So that seems like a very simple process, but uh, I know a few of you in the chat have worked with me, so you you know what this the power of this kind of thing. Um, and uh, there's there's a whole set of techniques um, uh, that are called the ladder of inference. When I'm talking to technical people, I often call it test driven development for people, which is another way of looking at it. And uh, the the those techniques which start with that um, kind of understanding the facts on the ground and then go further, um, those techniques are tremendously valuable for building trust. Those are in chapter three of Agile Conversations. So I'll just uh, show you that again. If you want a free copy of this, just write to me, um, Douglas. Squirrel, ds at douglasquirrel.com. Just go to douglasquirrel.com and you'll find all of my information. You find my phone number if you want to talk to me there. Um, uh, and it's in chapter three there. Uh, it will also be in the workshop, which I've mentioned a couple of times. So if you want to sign up for that, you can do that as well. Well, I said I would talk for about half an hour. So uh, that's what I've done. Uh, sorry for minor technical flubs at the beginning, but uh, I think we all managed to get on, and I hope everybody found this helpful so far. Um, but I would love questions. So uh, if you have any questions about the material we talked about, I will summarize it one more time just so uh, everybody knows and maybe prompt some questions. I'm, I can hang around as long as there are questions, or I'll go uh, walk the dog. Uh, either one is perfectly fine. Um, so the first thing we talked about is why refactoring is baloney. If somebody tells you, uh, hey, we're delayed because of refactoring, then you can wait 60 seconds and say you're not delayed anymore. Um, set the tilted slider appropriately. Here's my beautiful drawing of the tilted slider between predictability and productivity. So set that appropriately and move it up 
if you're being pulled down by the force of gravity, the desire for control, and uh, building trust with IT. And the method I suggested there was Lico Likrat, uh, find a way for each of you to understand the other's point of view and start there. And you only describe the other's point of view, uh, the, your own point of view and the others. Uh, you don't try to evaluate it until you've got that understanding of their point of view. All right. Well, uh, I hope that summary is helpful. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to wait a few seconds to see if you do. I would love to answer questions. I would show you my wife's beautiful guide dog, who who sometimes uh, is my audience and and barks and so on. But she she's decided the heated floor in this room is is not for her. I guess she, I guess she got too warm. So if she wanders in, I'll I'll show her off. Oh, George has one. Excellent. I'm ready for George's question. While George is doing that, I'm going to stick in a couple of links which people might find helpful. So here's DouglasSquirrel.com, which I've mentioned. Um, we also have. Um, uh, conversationaltransformation.com, which is where you can find lots more about the book. It's the one that I have jointly with my co-author, Jeffrey. George's question. I guess it's probably unique to each case, but in situations where pointy-haired people in suits have disagreements with software engineers of the nature you described, e.g. each party, wow, this is a long, multi-part question, this is great. Pointy-haired people have disagreements with software engineers of the nature you described, e.g. each party thinks the other is borderline sociopathically destroying the business. Okay, George is describing a very, um, a very vigorous disagreement, fantastic. What's going on for the engineers in their heads? What a fascinating question from George. Okay, um, well, what's happening is uh, mistrust. So um, I'm imagining, because uh, I, I, I know George a little bit, that he, he's not the engineer side. So um, he's, he's not asking because he's not sure what's going on in his head. He's asking because he wants to know what's going on in somebody else's head. Um, I'm always very wary of answering that question um, because the way to find out what's in somebody else's head is to ask them. Um, and that can be a challenging conversation and that kind of curiosity can feel threatening. So um, that, that would be my favorite way, but I will tell you what I have, what the kind of answer I often get. Uh, so you can have a guide to what to expect when you ask the question. And that answer is, um, oh, oh, there go the suits again. I used to say this. I used to say, uh, there are the suits again. Um, it's pizza box management. I remember one of my very first blog posts ever was on uh, why pizza box management was a bad way to, to, to manage um, because we were measuring based on the number of pizza boxes that you found in the morning. And if there were lots of pizza boxes, then you knew the team was working hard. And if not, you did you go and whip them some more. Um, this is a very um, unnuanced approach and a very unnuanced way to think about it. And um, it really comes from uh, a mindset that um, if you're not technical, you probably have about the engineers. Uh, and the engineers certainly have about non-technical people in many cases, which is that th those folks are just not thinking rationally. If they really just understood the actual situation, they'd think like me. And um, it, it comes from not being curious about the other person's position. The Lico Likrat method um, forces you to at least look at the other person's point of view and to understand why they're thinking that way. Why is this manager? I never asked this question when I wrote the, the pizza, block, blog, uh, pizza box blog post. That's hard to say. I never asked this question. But the question I should have asked is, why are they asking me about the pizza boxes? What is so important to them about this delivery that, that it, it's existential for them and they think it's really important that I get it done and therefore they're measuring with whatever they have, which is number of pizza boxes. Then I agree, it's a dumb metric, but what else could I do for them? What need is it meeting? And they're not asking that question. But there's a wonderful principle which isn't in, in the book and uh, I really hope Jeffrey and I get to write about it or um, uh, do a podcast episode. We have a podcast as well uh, called Troubleshooting Agile. Um, I really hope that we get to, 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 to write about this more. It's called the Frederick Mirroring Principle because Jeffrey came up with it first. His surname is Frederick. And uh, uh, Jeffrey um, came up with his principle, which goes like this. If you notice the other person doing something that isn't very helpful, for example, saying, oh, yeah, there go the suits again. You know, those, those uh, pointy haired people in suits, they, they just don't care about us. Uh, it's not working. Then the thing that you do is very counterintuitive. This is an advanced, tough technique. That I think I think George can handle it. I bet the rest of you can too. And this technique is to uh, immediately say to yourself, I am now going to apply whatever I tell them not to do to me. So I'm now going to mirror it. And I'm going to say, I probably am not listening very well to the other person's point of view because they certainly aren't listening to mine. 
And what tends to happen in human interactions is people mirror each other. They tend to, to do the same behavior. So if I sit like this, then all the good interview books and things will tell you, yeah, you should sit with your head on your hands as well. And if I move like this, then you should lean back in your chair. That, that's a way of building rapport with somebody. And it's very natural in terms of physical position. It's also what people do in their emotional position. It's what they do in their, their thinking, as George says, what's going on in their heads. So counterintuitively um, and, and painfully, because this is not easy, you're thinking to yourself, look at those idiots over there, they're doing this thing that's not helpful and you force yourself to do something different. That's difficult. I'm, I'm not suggesting this is an easy course of action. Um, but uh, uh, if you take it, then I predict that, first of all, you'll find out what's going on in their heads very quickly because you will shift your behavior and they will shift to match and you'll, you'll be able to ask. And it should build trust in the same way that the Le Code method does. So um, a long-winded answer to George's question, but um, the answer is probably the same thing as what's going on in your head namely mistrust of the other party. And the solution to it is counterintuitively fix your own uh, behavior first, change and ask for their point of view and try to understand it better. I hope that's helpful, challenging, but helpful. Any other questions? I would be very, very glad to have them. Excellent, George says, incredibly useful. I will take incredibly useful. If I can, if I can be incredibly useful every day, I will be a happy person. Waiting a little while for further questions. In the meantime, I will uh, tell you some stories. Oh, Robin says, this has been great. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to be helpful. Uh, I will take great as well. Great and uh, incredibly useful. Both both good comments. Uh, George and Robin have been the most active in the chat, so I appreciate you guys as well for, for commenting and, and uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, and participating in the, in the stream. Uh, I think that might be everything. I'm not sure there are any more questions. So uh, yeah, the, the tour of my house will have to wait until another time. It's my 600 year old house here in Folkestone. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll do that on a future stream. If you enjoyed this, uh, sure would be happy to hear from you. Um, you can get in touch at DouglasSquirrel.com. You'll find my email, my phone, my home address. You can come down, visit me, see, see the house and the guide dog. Uh, you'd be very, very welcome. Uh, maybe let me know before you visit. Okay, uh, glad to have all of you here. Uh, enjoyed it very much. The video will be here available afterwards. And if you're interested in the workshop or working with me or just asking me some questions or telling me I was all wet and refactoring is actually not baloney, uh, you could find me at douglasquirrel.com. Excellent. Thanks, everybody.